each day the former president, who is a fit and vigorous man, has fallen asleep before the lunch break. Uh, I usually like to doze this, off after lunch. Maybe if that's... this had happened to Joe Biden, it would, I mean, a solid month of coverage. There would be 18 stories in the New York Times. It happens to Trump, and it's just like, meh. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is JVL here with my best friend, Tim Miller, and sitting in for Sarah Longwell, our Bulwark colleague, A.B. Stoddard. A.B., welcome back to the show, and please give us the T-shirt reveal. <laughs> yes. Um, Trump's trial reminded me that I am a Pence donor, as I've revealed on the dark side before. I bought this T-shirt to Honest, Mike, Pen for, Mike Pence for president on the back. Right That's before fantastic. I joined the Bulwark for $37. That's right on brand. And the reason I remembered this yesterday and wore it today was because my information then went to Nikki Haley and then went to Donald Trump, who blasted ah. me yesterday and said, I stormed out of court yesterday. They think I'm finished, but I'll never surrender. And it reminded me that he is going to bullshit his supporters about what happened in court every single day, and they will believe him. The judge cannot go on CNN and disagree, and it's going to drive me fucking bonkers. He even could, actually, because <laughs> they don't watch CNN. Right. And the, so unless the judge was going to go on Real America's Voice right. uh, to correct the record, I don't think it would matter. Yeah. Uh, JVL, though, we're, we're discussing the green room because of AB's donations her are rel relative donations and i'm excited yes. to hear your you reveal so yours. I've, i have made two political donations lifetime both of which were for the merch they were <laughs> they had nothing to do with the politicians they were just, and the first was the rick santorum 2012 camp presidential campaign when he was wearing his blue sweater vest and i just thought this thing is an instant classic and so i gave him like whatever the 25 or 50 bucks you needed to get in order to get the vest was there a this Santorum one... joke on there? On the... was like there no, it just has like his little eagle. And it was like, I was just going to give it away to, mm. I think I gave it away to uh, a weekly standard reader as a gag. Mm. But the fulfillment took like 18 months. And so this is why, AB, I was amazed that you got your t-shirt so quick. Because I assumed that in political circles, you know, you give them your money and then eight months after the election is over, you get your, you get your oh, merch. Oh no, Mike Pence is too honest. He would not run a ship that way. <laughs> And my I, second, my second one uh, was Jared Polis, your uh, guy, and it was because okay. he was putting out Jared Polis NFTs, <laughs> and I just thought this is too good to be true, and so Are I gave I, again. I think it was fifty bucks. Do I'm a proud, proud owner. owner. I think of because they're numbered. I think number thirty-seven wow. of the Jared Polis NFTs, and uh, maybe when I'm in Denver, I'll go over to the governor's mansion. If governor mansion is in Denver, I don't yeah, actually know what the capital of that weird it state is, is. Yeah. Um, and I'll ask him to sign my NFT. Well, that was like Sign kind of a soft reveal picture. about how we might be having an event in Denver. Still working on that, but we do have an event in Philly coming up May 1st in Washington, D.C., May, May 15th. Bring your um, batteries. Bulwark.com slash events. I, uh, please buy tickets. Come hang out. I do I do want to say my two donations are much are let much uh, more out of spite than both of yours. Oh, spite donations are the best. I have a couple. I, mean, I have a couple of guys donated to my own candidates, so I bought a T-shirt. But like, I have two message sending spite donations in my life. Are you ready for them? Mm -hmm. Number one shows you the full circle we've all come on. I spite donated to Mike Enzi because I was so pissed at Liz Cheney <laughs> for challenging him and not and 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 screwing her sister by not coming out for gay marriage when she challenged him in that primary, and I was so mad at her. And now we have all come full circle, and Liz Cheney and I have both done the right things in our life, and we are aligned, and we've both made amends for our mistakes. And so I do think that's funny. I was a Mike Enzi donor. And my other one uh, was also it's all it's gay it's gay spite related really uh, it was Doug Jones and this Doug Jones thing oh. ended up becoming a whole thing I sent the Roy out a Moore tweet. Doug Jones race what's that Roy Moore Doug Jones race okay. and this was when I was still Republican in good standing and I sent out a tweet that was like this is the first time I've ever voted for or donated to a Democrat but fuck you Roy Moore and fuck you everybody that's supporting this Afiba file <laughs> I'm supporting Doug Jones and it became such it went so viral. That literally an NPR stringer, I was living in Cal Oakland at the time, came to my home to do a story 
on this like <laughs> re- on this weird gay Republican living in Oakland who just donated to a Democrat for the first time. They did like a soft feature on me on the local NPR. So, you know, those are my t- so I think this is good. Mike Pence, Mike Enzi, Doug Jones. We're going to pretend like you didn't say Rick Santorum. Jared, Jared Polis. Polis. That's a good Rick foursome this for is us. The, you, know, you know, Jim, the that's, it is amazing. First of all, Mike Enzi was a really great guy and a great member and a serious legislator. Is he dead? Why did you say I was? Is he a bad guy uh, now or is he dead? He's passed away. Oh, okay. Am I, I, am I, I going to be wrong that. about that? I don't know. Sebastian will check. But it <laughs> Sebastian is, is furiously but it is Googling Mike Enzi. to remember that time when people were absolutely furious with Liz Cheney. For, for yeah. challenging Mike Enzi. Um, it is just a wild, wild look back um, into the into the four times. But I do think you got the most mileage having a soft feature done on you. For your yeah. Boy more. You. I don't know. My NFT, that thing, the, the value of that poll. I mean, honestly, the, the, the value of my Trump truth social stock. Oh, yeah. Versus my Jared Polis NFT. I mean, meeting in the middle. Also, Jeff, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to quit this this gig because I'm going to retire off of off of those things. Do you have any? Uh, all right. Listen, do, I'm sorry. I, one more merch. Do yes. You have any recollection of the piece I wrote for the Bulwark when I bought the White House coin of Trump with Kim Jong Un for this? I bought the yes. summit coin, you guys. And and Dave, and we and we did coin. awesome art and it was amazing. Do you still have it? It's somewhere in here. I dug I mean, out this in your safe shirt. deposit box. Somewhere. I would not put it. Swi- your Swiss account vault. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the. Got a bunch of things to talk about today. We're going to talk about the Trump trial. We're going to talk about. We're going to have an after action report on a, a recent Tim podcast, which was so big that it couldn't be contained by a podcast. But we're going to start in the House of Representatives, the People's House, where Speaker Mike Johnson is just. He's. He's. Sh- I, I don't even like, like he's spinning plates or he's juggling footballs or watching monkeys fuck footballs. I don't know. But there's something weird happening. He's trying to pass four bills in a week after, you know, months of doing nothing. We have both Marjorie Taylor Greene and Thomas Massey who have said they're coming to take his gavel. Uh, it's all moving very fast and it's all amazing. And Tim, please go first. I'm hoping I don't maybe by the time this is out, we have bill text. It's kind of fun. This has been uh, a great history of, uh, you know, like the last three, um, uh, the last three speakers, Republican speakers, where it's like they'll leak something to Jake Sherman, fast break Jake Sherman, who's over at Fishbowl. And it's like, I've got I've got the plan. It's going to happen now. All right. I've got the crazies on board. I've got the regulars on board. We're going to leak it. We're going to we have we, we figured it out. And then it goes out, and there's some, there's a little some excitement on Twitter, and people are like, okay, they're gonna do it, they're gonna have these they these votes, and then and then it's like 20 minutes later, some lunatic, you know, puts out, I would like John Boehner's head on a spike before I vote for this, and like this is what <laughs> happened yesterday, where like Mike Johnson finally thought he had it, and then 20 minutes later, Thomas Massey is says, I resign, sir, resign now, and I'm supporting Marjorie Taylor Greene, so it turns out he doesn't have it. They had. They were supposed to have released the text by yesterday, Tuesday afternoon, so that, so that they could follow the seventy-two hour rule, to where people can read the bill and then vote on Friday because they go on another you mean vacation. Where people can pretend to read the bill. Yeah, weren't they just on vacation? Right. Apparently, they have another vacation next week. It's hard to keep track of all these spring breaks these guys have. I thought my kid had a lot of vacation times because we have Mardi Gras break and spring break here in Louisiana, but she's going to like triple the amount of school that they're going to Congress. But so they have another vacation next week, and so. Now it's not, it's still not, we're taping this to Wednesday morning. And so we'll see what the actual, you know, he's meeting again with the, with the crazy caucus. Be like, what can I, what can I give you to make sure you don't, you know, motion to vacate me. And, you know, the fourth bill in this package is already weird. It like combines like TikTok with a new lend lease act with like, we're seizing some rush. You know, there's some good stuff in there. Um, And it's just like, the reality is these guys, can't pass anything. Well, they can pass one thing. I want to get to that in a second. They can they can name they can condemn things, but they can't actually pass anything. And you know we're on month six now. There've been more there are more deaths in Ukraine um, overnight. Another attack. And uh, you know there's just there doesn't seem to be no one has come to the realization that we've come to on this podcast for many many months, which is that a handful of good Republicans 
quote unquote, have to do the right thing and work with Democrats to do a motion to or to do a uh, uh, what the fuck? Do you discharge. Petition. Petition. Thank you. Discharge petition. I'm going to have another sip of coffee, do a discharge petition or else it's not going to happen. Like they just they don't have the votes maybe. And, and who knows? Maybe they'll figure finally after long last that he'll get the Democrats to bail them out again. But it is really and it's just an epic clusterfuck. A.B., so it seems like Johnson is counting on the Democrats to help him here. But after seemingly gotten a deal with them to help him decide to go back to the conservative caucus to see if he can sweeten it for them, which is maybe going to is he trying to screw the Dems here? I don't quite understand. No, from his perspective, what he thinks he's doing. No, he's not trying to screw the Democrats. I think that I mean, first of all, Mike Johnson has a he thinks he's Moses. And he said yesterday in his professorial tone that he they need a steady hand at the wheel. And he said, I regard myself, not I, even I think of myself, I regard myself as a wartime speaker. So he's telling now. Who is the greatest challenge since any speaker since the Civil War. Yes. So he is telling donors who are saying, we're not going to fund this shit show one more month. You've lost members. They're leaving early to fuck you over intentionally. You all hate each other and you're trying to sink your majority. So he's telling them, as he told President Zelensky and others, that he intends to do the right thing. So that what he has designed lets him look like he's doing the right thing and that he's trying to please everybody and navigate the choppy waters and govern. And I get, JVL and I've talked about this, I now and then get a little hopeful that he has a, an ounce of shame and wants to do the right thing and feels terrible about Ukraine. And in the FISA debate, when, when Trump, either because he does have some kind of dementia onset, con, confused and conflated Title I of FISA with Section 702 with FISA a week and a half ago, he either did it intentionally he, he or read. not. I think. I'm not sure it's dementia. But, I just don't think he can read. But when he did it, Donald uh, Johnson stuck his neck out and said, you know, I know members are, are confused about this and, and they're and they're, uh, you know, they're making up s stuff about this, but they, they have to go to the skiff as I did. And he said they need to seek the same information. You've got to be fully informed. And he defied Trump on this. So I have my moments where I think he's either trying to do the right thing or he's signaling to donors that he intends to do the right thing. Either one, right, gets him to these to this middle land where he's Moses in the middle of all the madness and he's going to do the right thing and save everybody. He's not. Everything that that Tim just described, this entire like four step process, four bills, but under a single rule, but open to amendment. And the minute you open this up, you sink it and you kill it. The Senate was never going to this was never going to work out. And so um, it, it's designed to look like he cares and he's really sorry it didn't work out. And then um, you know, all he had to do was pass the Senate bill. So he's on this call after Iran attacks Israel and, and President Biden and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries all say to him, Mike, we've got to pass the Senate bill. There's no other thing we can do. And this is the mess that he gave us. It's completely intentional. Um, it's designed to be a shit show that looks like he's a good guy trying to do the right thing. I don't think he's going to get kicked out and i think that he can count he knows he's he can count on the democrats if they try to take his job i don't think marge has the votes i don't think it'll happen i think she just wants to keep fundraising off it but if that happens yes he knows that the that this is such a gimme for the democrats that they will gladly call out on the house floor that they support speaker mike johnson keeping his job because they want to look like they're governing so he knows he has that in his pocket and that's my take I have a question for you, A.B., one follow-up. Um, or maybe this is more a question for Mike Johnson, for Fast Break Jake or Joe Perticone to ask. Um, who is he at war with? He's a wartime speaker. <laughs> woke. Because, like, the Democrats, like, the He's other... He's at war with woke, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Woke. Yeah. Because the other party, the opposition party, is trying to help him. Like, right. they want to cut a deal with him. Right. And the president of the of the opposition party wants to cut a deal with him. <laughs> It's like who is he at war with exactly? It seems like he's at war with Matt, like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Is that the war? It's a it's Aren't a civil we all war with ourselves in a way. Yeah, it's an internal war. What you know, I, there are two wolves. 
There are two wolves inside each of us, <laughs> Timothy. The good wolf and I the just, bad wolf. I was a little confused about the wartime thing. I think I... he uh, he's really a pompous dude, and the idea of I mean, he's already invoked Moses. Why, why are we even bringing up the wartime thing, right? Why? Sh yeah. Like this is just—it's deeply pathetic. But yes, the Christian war. <laughs> Right. It's a religious war. Right. So, Probably. Amy, you, you follow this stuff more closely than I do. So I just want to drill down here. So your view is that basically th this is a grand strategy on Johnson's behalf to A, keep donors on board while B, keeping his job. And looking like and he's... he has no illusions. Right. Looking like he's trying to pass the stuff when he knows it won't pass. And when he will then not be willing to do any of the stuff that would let it pass. Like, for instance, if he released members to uh, vote for the discharge position, right, that would then, I assume, trigger his removal as speaker. Right. So he really is. Can, he cares about holding on to the job here. Yes, he does. And I think that he believes that he was called to this moment. I'm sorry. It sure. sounds absurd, but that's what I think he believes. And I think that the way so. He goes to Mar-a-Lago last Friday. Trump says, maybe we could give Ukraine a loan and set up a gift. I'm here to back Mike Johnson. Last night, as we know, he said, we'll see what happens with Mike Johnson. So he's already thrown him overboard. He's not standing out there and trying to make a public showing against Marjorie Taylor Greene and Thomas Massey for Mike Johnson to keep his job. But Mike Johnson, as I said, he knows that Jeffries is going to provide a couple of guys who are going to give him the votes to keep his job. No matter what happens, that's as plain as day. It's just too good politically for the for the Democrats to, to not do it. They're going to do it. They're going to look like the grownups. They're going to get credit from voters for it. When but that's even worse for Johnson in the long term, right? To be a speaker whose speakership depends on the votes of Democrats. Yes, of course it is. But I think that the way he yeah. You can say the Boehner survived like that for years. You can say the discharge petition is terrible for him. Well, everything's terrible for him. So if he lets this right. four part, you know, clusterfuck go down, then and then he and then, uh oh, people did a discharge petition without me. It looks like I can't control the House floor. Well, that's already been decided. And then someone does the motion to vacate after a discharge petition. He keeps his job from the Democrats and, and the aid goes through. I mean, so so the people understand what Johnson is dealing with here. I want to Republican Representative Garrett Graves yesterday said uh, was asked, does the speaker strategy make sense to you? And this is what uh, Congressman Garrett Graves said in a word. No, the reality is, is you have to keep in mind. President Biden asked for Ukraine. President Biden asked for Israel. President Biden asked for aid to Taiwan. And President Biden supports the changes to TikTok. What are Republicans getting out of this? I've got it. Tim. I just, this fucking douchebag, this douche canoe, Garrett Graves, just for some context, he's a, he's the Baton Rouge congressman. He's, he's, he's about, he got drawn out. Oh, I um, could have so, done a voice. Yeah. Yeah. Man, what a Rouge. missed opportunity. He's kind of not really though, because he's a Baton Rouge congressman who is a fancy boy. Uh, he was Kevin McCarthy's, you know, little right hand man. He's one of these establishment guys that's fake MAGA. Okay, so Garrett Graves is Mike Gallagher, but from the South. All right, like that's who Garrett Graves is. <laughs> all right, so he is not, this is not, you know, like dealing with Marge or Lauren Boebert or Paul Gosar. Like this is, that quote is from somebody who, you know, if you asked the, I guess I won't name, I won't name the person from segment three. If you ask some of our friends, and the conservative media and the mainstream conservative media, who these closet normal Republicans are, who the normal Republicans are, they're talking about Garrett Graves would be the type of person they would mention. So that is that's who that's what we're dealing with here. And his quote is he can't support Johnson, you know, because he doesn't feel like the Republicans are getting anything out of this. So there's two elements to this. One is these guys butt hurt because he was Kevin McCarthy's friend. So I guess there's just some childishness to that. Um, but the but just like how bad of a quote this is on the face of it. I mean, this is like he is literally saying that the Republicans are not for Ukraine aid, Israel aid, Taiwan aid, or the changes to TikTok. Republicans aren't getting anything out of those policies, right? That 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 Johnson has to get something that Republicans want. So, I mean, this undermines like the core argument of everybody in the 
you know, Wall Street Journal apologist class of Republicans that are like, oh, Joe Biden doesn't want to support Israel. Joe Biden is distancing himself from Bibi. We have a Republican member of Congress saying directly <laughs> that the Republicans don't want aid for Israel. That it's Biden and who wants Biden it. Biden does. Biden yeah. wants Israel aid. Republicans don't. This is this is a Republican congressman who was in leadership till recently. So, I, I, as plain as day, right there in the quote, that that what that Republicans need to get something to own the libs. That's what that's what the subtext is here. Biden needs to be owned. And Biden can't be owned through a, with aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan because Biden wants Israel, aid to Israel, uh, Ukraine, and Taiwan. So Biden needs to be owned. That's the thing that Republicans – that's how Republicans get something out of this is by owning the libs. That's what this guy thinks his job is. And he's one of the normal ones. And he's one of the normal <laughs> ones, supposedly. Okay. So, like, that's what you're dealing with in the House conference right now. Like, these just nihilistic, childish shitbirds. Garrett Graves. I'm not. I'm as. Boy, when Sarah's not here, we can say all sorts of stuff. I'm as. Blue. I'm as mad as as Tim. I'm not going to bang anything because this whole thing will fall over. But um, Garrett Graves was a staffer not only in the House but in the Senate, like Kevin McCarthy. He is a complete institutionalist, and he is known by his colleagues as a serious legislator and policy mm. wonk who has studied I mean, all this stuff like to me. and knows how bipartisan deals are made. He was assigned by Kevin McCarthy, not as budget chairman or a member of the leadership, to honcho the entire debt deal with Joe Biden on the debt ceiling last May. And this is what he said about it. We didn't go in and ask for the sun, moon, and stars. We calibrated our ask with our leverage that resulted in what I think is a pretty conservative win, cutting spending by $2.1 trillion, the largest spending reduction in spending history. Okay, everyone in MAGA hated the deal, and Kevin McCarthy loses his job over it ultimately. But he is a realist. He is a measured non-radical who thinks that the radicals in Congress, because of their social media profiles, are misleading the American people, he tells the Rip-On Society on February 5th of this year. Two months ago. He says we mislead them and made them believe that we can do, that we can achieve this at anything short of balancing the budget tomorrow or absolutely closing the border and having the wall built next week. Anything short of going back to the energy policies of the Bush administration is a failure. He wants incremental wins, he tells them. And he says that the whole representation of what's in the best interests of the American public is being doused right now by this dysfunction in government, this civil war that's happening in our party. And to some degree within the Congress where politics reign instead of what's best for the country. He's so upset and despairing about the breakdown of the system. And you know what? He has beef with Scalise and their districts are adjourning and there's some kind of inner Nessine leadership BS where Graves said that on purpose because he's so afraid he's being run down now that his buddy Kevin is out and he has beef with Scalise, who's majority leader, that he had to intentionally say this douchebag, and you'll have to tell me later what douche canoe means, this douchebag comment to try to save face it's like with Mike Johnson and Mega. All right, so, A.B., what I'm hearing you say then is that he agrees that Mike Johnson is a wartime speaker. Okay. Probably. <laughs> Did you get the uh, douche canoe definition from Sebastian in? No, uh, so we're good. not going to do that. And, uh, and I, you, I think it's pretty I'm good, to save you from, from <laughs> I, boy, I have some stories. Boy, I have stories for you. But we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about how this show is sponsored by Green Chef. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for clean eating and ranked the number one meal kit overall by U.S. News and World Report. Uh, they deliver quality whole foods with limited processed ingredients, including low added sugar and sodium smart options, so you can eat with a clean conscience. Each week, choose from 80 plus flavor packed options and you can mix and match meals, not to mention flavors from their different dietary preferences like keto, Mediterranean and more. Preparing each meal can take as little as 30 minutes for dinner or 10 minutes for lunch. 
And did you know Green Chef is owned by another one of our sponsors, HelloFresh. Mm. Oh, I love HelloFresh people. So now you can switch between the two and have a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Plus, since April is Earth Month, you should know sustainability is a key part of the Green Chef brand, with the company offsetting 100% of delivery emissions and 100% of plastic in each box. Uh, I mean, that's all very nice, but I'll tell you the only thing I care about, which is that the meal prep is very easy and my children all like it. So uh, for me in my household, uh, the the idea of getting all four of the children to eat a meal and not complain because they like it is the holy grail. <laughs> and there is nothing else that fits that. There's I can't pizza. I can't do macaroni and cheese. We have, you know, there's like orange chicken and then uh the green chef meals we've gotten so that's that's the highest endorsement that exists uh go to greenchef.com slash next level 50 and use code next level 50 to get 50 percent off plus 20 percent off your next two months that's 50 percent off plus 20 percent off your next two months when you go to greenchef.com slash next level 50 Start enjoying the number one meal kit for eating well today. I want the All code right. for the next sponsor to be Garrett Graves sucks balls. Go go to you know maybe we'll go, ask them for that. maybe we'll ask them for that. Um, um, all right, so Donald Trump is. Can we world... before we go to Donald Trump? Can I do yeah. one more congressional rant? I have one sure. more. It's, sure. just, it's just a brief one. It could be a three-hour like show. <laughs> That's all. I right. think it's worth noting. This is a great show. It's a good short short show. Um, I just c- Congress did do something this week. I just I just think it's important oh, right. to acknowledge yes, when Congress you. does something. Yeah, they, they passed can, a resolution. They, they passed a resolution that the slogan "From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free" is anti-Semitic, and its use must be condemned. And here's the thing: you want to do these fucking things like where we're condemning random things. It's fine, but to me, it seems like the anti should be like you have to do other stuff. Like you know, you, if you can't just condemn things. Or else, I, I really do think we might be on a path. Because this is like the entire Republican conference, save maybe two or three people, and then like maybe eight Democrats probably are for this, would be for this plan, which is that we should just, Congress should just stop legislating altogether. The executive should do all the policy making, and all Congress should do every day is vote on whether people's tweets are offensive or not. And we can just take turns putting up putting up different tweets and putting up different slogans and and be like racist or not racist and that's Congress now uh, for tw- for the twenty thirties. I think that that's maybe might, might be where we're heading. I think that'd make a lot of people happy. You think I'm kidding? I think that they would most representatives, certainly most of the Republican Party, would view that as a relief because they they believe you know, uh, as Madison Cawthorn put it, that uh, they they ought to be just doing comms, right? They they came to Washington to get onto Fox News. Yeah. And if they could just tweet without having to worry about all the other stuff, that'd be great. But it's also right. part of, you know, people should learn about Project 2025 and the dystopian hellscape that Donald Trump has planned for us with his yeah, Christian nationalist alarmist. friends. It's all to vastly centralize all of the power in the executive and take Correct. away our representation anyway. I mean, A.B., you'd have to believe that uh, things are going to be totally different in a second Trump term, if you believe that. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the trial is ongoing. <laughs> We've had two days of trial, and in each day, the former president, who is a fit and vigorous man, has fallen asleep before the lunch break. Uh, I usually like to doze this... off after lunch. Maybe if that's... this had happened to Joe Biden, it would, I mean, a solid month of coverage. There would be 18 stories in the New York Times. It happens to Trump, and it's just like, eh. Yeah. Great. I brought it up on MSNBC. I wasn't asked, but I just oh. I just kind of brought it up as a non sequitur. Just and have that go like over. Somebody should mention it. It was fine. The, you know, the Chris Jansen was just kind of like, hmm, okay, you know, and then asked me a question about so something nobody else. cares. Nobody cares. Uh, do you guys have thoughts on the trial? I mean, I, 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 I hope you're level setting some expectations and bringing them way down. Both of you, yes? So I think on Monday morning, I thought, oh, he has the power to make people think that it's a petty case and engender some kind of sympathy. And now I feel like there's kind of a pathetic uh, protest outside 
It's going to be the same thing every day. He wears the same clothes. He goes in and out of the same doors and he goes to camera and says the same thing. And he likes, now he's going to the, to do these stunts at the bodega and, and he trashes the judge and, and he looks like hell. And I just think, I'm thinking now on Wednesday that Americans are going to be like, shut it off, you boring, ranting lunatic. Like, it's kind of making me feel now that I don't know that it's going to, I don't think a conviction changes the course of this campaign. I really don't. And of course, an acquittal empowers him. But I feel like this whole idea that he can change the 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 narrative and and gain sympathy and support by being a defendant in a trial. I'm not buying it now. It just seems so dull and monotonous. And I mean, I know JVL's promised me drama. There's going to be all sorts of salty characters coming through and testifying. But so far, it's like, you know, Tim, I, I, you know, I know I'm supposed to talk about the what this means for Trump and blah blah blah. I'm just I'm not so sure it means anything. Um, that that we that it does. I think we're kind of on a similar trajectory. And so, can I tell you the thing about this trial that's brought me a little bit of joy? The news brings you so little joy these days, and so I like to try to focus on it. Is I, I, have you been reading like, like the the reports from the courtroom about the challenges to the jurors? I just <laughs> love the menagerie of human of the human experience. You know, unlike JVL, I thing. love humans. I love hearing their stories. Like there's the person who was like, I went to the lake for six weeks with no Wi-Fi and I don't even know what this trial is about. Like I love that person. Then there's a person who re then there was a lengthy debate over whether one juror should be expelled because he reads the Borowitz report. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the judge is you're going back and forth and it's like well the board writs report enjoyer it turns out that is not disqualifying uh maybe it's disqualifying in certain in a certain way but not for this jury and you know going and then they're like looking at the fate like this one person and it's like was this person lying or is this just a just a weird human but it was election night of 2020 and people were honking in their cars and this person's posting on Facebook like you everybody should honk too it's so fun and they're asked about this and they're like why were you doing that was it because you were so excited Trump lost and they're like no I thought it was cool that people were honking <laughs> <laughs> it's like, is that person lying because they want to be on the jury so bad? Or is it just the great and good people of New York that some people just like the honking parties? I don't know. So I, I've enjoyed that part of it. Um, and I've enjoyed Donald Trump falling asleep and making fun of him for that. And um, and that's about all my thoughts at day three of the of this trial. You know, uh, us New Yorkers. Yeah, you can. We're tell used me to celebrity. That. We're you know we don't get blown away by the big lights. You're like, hey, look, it's uh, it's Brad Pitt, and Madonna, whatever. It's Tuesday, right? I mean, yeah. that's how we are. And uh, yeah. I think it is beautiful. Were, were you thinking you might get called to the jury? That would have been interesting for I mean, you to be in the jury pool. I don't know how many years you have to be living in the borough before mm. <laughs> you qualify. I think mm. there's a homesteading aspect. <gasps> to it. Anyway, I uh, I I do. Think I think it's funny how the people on the resistance left are just so honestly self-reporting. Like, yeah, I read the Barowitz report. You know, like yeah. you would think that if this was some gigantic crime family conspiracy, then there would be a bunch of resistance people doing their very best to appear not resistancy, yeah. so as to railroad your favorite totally innocent <laughs> president. But that's not where we are. Okay. It also speaks to the just the deep state conspiracies, how stupid they are. We all know they're stupid, but it's like any in any of these scenarios about like, oh, the deep states have to get Trump. I just like, I, I wish people read. You know, I wish that that Newsmax viewers read because I'd like to like send them like like look at these like look at just the human frailty here. Like this is not a big plot. Like these are just a range of humans: some smart, some stupid, some pretty, some ugly. You know, some nice, some mean. You know, it's just the whole human experience at play here. And everybody gets a chance to argue about it back and forth. I, you know, like there's no plot. But Lou anyway. Reed wrote a song about it. Okay. You like that? You like that, Tim? I do Pong, like that. A Lou Reed poll? Come on, I man. I've, I, I wish I had seen Lou Reed before he died on the street in New York like you. That's the kind of celeb sightings that I would I mean, I would back enjoy. in the day. Like you. When I was, when Speaking I was of dead up, people, by the way, Mike Enzi did die July 2021. He broke his tragically. bicycle in an accident, Tragically, which is really sad. Mm -hmm. R.I.P. Mike Enzi.
Yeah. Now let's get to the thing that everybody wants to hear. <laughs> Tim, you had a podcast yesterday. Would you like to tell the class about it? I had a great podcast. It was with uh, New York Times columnist Ross Douthat. I don't know if you know a lot about him, JVL. Uh, he's kind of interesting. He's sort of heterodox he's views on issues. I'm not yeah, sure if no, you're a big great. reader of his column or not. Um, but, uh, you know, look, I don't want to make a habit of having people on the podcast and then coming on this podcast and dunking on them. I, so I, I'll just say this, and then I, I'm interested in your two, uh, the thoughts that you two have having listened to it. Um, it's very, like, I just think it's very revealing how hard it is for somebody that knows Donald Trump is dangerous and, and, and immoral and irredeemable to like come up with rationales for not opposing him. It's like very challenging. And it's just, it's, and, and that's why I, I want to invite more people who have that view on the podcast because hopefully I'll be enlightened by one of them at some point to try to understand. Uh, because I, I just, I felt like Ross, who is very eloquent and very smart on certain topics, mm -hmm. like when that topic comes up, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like it, you know, it's, it's this, you know, trying to like debating jello, you know, or smoke. And it's a very challenge. And you immediate moves to a meta, right? Like rather than speaking for myself about why I would understand voting for Trump, now I'm going to change the topic and pretend like I'm an imaginary Hispanic voter on the border, you know, who didn't go to college. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not asking you to explain. That's We have a podcast for that, the Focus Group podcast. It's very good where you can hear why real people – are supporting Trump or not supporting Trump. I was trying to understand why you don't, you know, cannot clearly say whether you think Donald Trump or Joe Biden is more threatening. And that was a very challenging question for him to answer. And, and the description, the, the, um, the explanations were just kind of hard to follow, were, were rather hard to follow. And I, and I think that that's revealing in a certain way. So that's AB, what I'll what, say about the interview. I think it's worth listening to. What did you make of it? I thought it was a great show. AB, what were your thoughts? Well, um, Tim is doing the right thing and providing a safe space for anti antis is it was, it's very, no, it's very revealing and it's, 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 it's really worth, it's a, it's a worthy exercise and he does it well. And I just, I really commend you for the, for, um, for the whole discussion and, and the idea. And I, I'm glad you're reached trying to, to learn more of them into these really calm and measured conversations and it did not it did not get i didn't think it got tense once i thought it was really enjoyable to listen to but it was so illustrative of this tension where it gives people like ross some kind of comfort to say that in the bulwark community of never trumpers we're doing something wrong but they are trying to stay on this cleaner, more clarified path that they also cannot describe or defend. So at one point he says to Tim, I'm actually trying to convince people uh, not to support Trump in 2024. It was so insane. And he ended up, of course, he, he got very incensed at the end and everyone has to listen to every minute about how it's turned that Trump's detractors, of course, we've heard this so many times from the anti-anti crowd, have turned his critics into deranged people who drool and can't, you know, complete a sentence. Um, and it, it was sad in that way. He's very tortured. He admitted he has not decided what he will do faced with this decision. So he's, he didn't know how to rank Biden as a president. It was... It's just a, it was complete and utter mess, but Tim handled it masterfully. It is an important discussion. Ross was actually super, I thought, you know, friendly and charming and, and took it well, but he did run around in many, many tortured circles. Yeah, and and it's hard is, to be an anti-anti. Yeah. I know that people want JVL's view on this, but the weird thing about that is like, right, I began the discussion on just policy, like outside of this. And, and it's like Ross is kind of like thoughtful on foreign policy. I, I, I disagreed. I, he, was, he was a little a little soft on Putin for my taste in certain things, but we kind of discussed back and forth. And he was directionally. Well, Ross is just an isolationist. Yeah, I mean, but he, so, yeah, but he was know, directionally Ross is, sympathetic Ross is a to the way that Biden is. Biden is isolationist. 
Yeah, but but yeah. he's he was directly sympathetic to the way that Biden has kind of managed, you know, try you know the the more isolationist and the more hawkish elements of his own coalition, and like we talked about that, and and so then you know to go from that like a kind of a detailed policy discussion to like not being able to just kind of say whether you think that Donald Trump was worth it, whether he's a good president or not, whether he's a better president than Joe Biden. You just sort of lends you to be like, like, there's something here you're not saying. And is it is it that you th- and I and I and I think JVL and that's what I'm interested in JVL's take. I think I think JVL might think that it's that I think that he actually likes Trump. Maybe that's true, but to me it might be that like actually he agrees with us basically. <laughs> that like that's Obama what I and Biden have been better, but he doesn't want to say it because that you can't be the conservative New York Times columnist and say that. It, I, I literally could be either. That is the one area where I failed, I think, in the interview, because you can't tell because like the because it's so elusive. So anyway, JVL, what was your take? Yeah, I uh, I mean, so look, I have some some global criticisms of the way in which Ross sort of unequally views the world uh, as a, for instance, Throughout your conversation, there was a lot of benefit of the doubt giving. Yeah, like, we have no idea what the pro-life movement will look like in 20 years from now. A lot of like, you know, was the Dobbs decision bad for the pro-life movement? And Ross's answer was like the, the old Chinese proverb about the guy getting the free horse. It's like, too soon to tell, too soon to tell. And it's like, okay, that's an interesting worldview. Um, but then when he, there was a moment when he mentioned Kamala Harris, and he just missed, just dismissed her as incompetent and i was just like huh i would like you to show your work on that because like what i mean i i agree kamala harris has political problems in how she's perceived she certainly had an executive problem in running a national campaign for president but in her time as vice president and her time as senator like what what are the examples of incompetence you know like it just again ross is is very, very eager to bend over backwards and extend every benefit of the doubt to his perceived allies. And his charity for his perceived enemies, as exhibited by like, you know, his like when he got wound up about the left at the end, I was like, dude is five minutes away from talking about kitty litter boxes in schools. Um it was it was really weird. Um I, I, there was another moment that, that bothered me a little bit. He, you know, he was talking about how, you know, this is something we see a lot, how the, the time to stop Trump was at the second impeachment. And he was talking about how that was such an important moment and the Senate Republicans failed. And so I was like, huh, I don't remember Ross writing about that a lot. And so I went back to the archives. Um, and between January 13. 2021, which is when the House passed the Articles of Impeachment, and February 13th, uh, which was the day the Senate acquitted Trump, Ross wrote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces, uh, the first of which was about impeachment. Uh, and I remember this because this piece, he started out by talking about me and sort of, you know, chastised me for always having the darkest possible view and, you know, you can't trust me and blah, 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 blah. Um and he then said that, uh, you know, he thinks, of course, the most likely thing is that McConnell won't 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 get rid of him. But but maybe he will. And, you know, like he always is. Ross was wrong. Uh, the next column was called the Biden Opportunity. Then there was Joe Biden's Catholic moment. Then there was a sort of generic how Trump ate populism. Then we had San Francisco schools, radicalism in the pandemic, long haul COVID and the chronic illness debate. And finally, Three days before the Senate trial began, why the U.S. needs the Romney family plan. After Donald Trump was acquitted by the Republican Senate, uh, we had his first two columns were about an obituary for Rush Limbaugh and then the COVID emergency must end. So for a guy who seems so convinced about how, like, you know, that the time to do it was then, I don't see Ross doing a lot of heavy lifting or even engaging on the question of, from I mean, like you know, he sort of wrote about it in passing once. Yeah, I I uh, want this is really the Kamala point. That's very good. I I did not, uh, um, you know, was not prepared with his uh, full list of his columns from January through February twenty twenty one. I did have one f- failing though. I mean, I wasn't yeah. either. I'm just taking yeah. this off from memory. Maybe yeah, I'm no. 
<laughs> and I think this is good. You didn't do any app on this. I think this is good going forward. It's another one of the reasons I want to have these conversations is that like for for as you know, as we might describe, you know, that point of view as not having a ton of coherence. There's a lot of people that have it, right? Like oh, not, yeah. there's it's not like fifty one percent like him and Chris Sununu want, but there's a decent percentage of kind of important voters, frankly, that have his point of view. And so I do think my one feeling is is and now looking back is when I'm at, when you're having conversations with people like this in your life going ahead to November. There was one thing that he was kept doing that I was not prepared for because it just didn't even occur to me, which is that Joe Biden is is responsible for like everything that happens everywhere in the world during his presidency, and yet like so Donald Trump outcomes, is yeah. not responsible for COVID or George Floyd or any of the racial stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. no. And Ross is telling the Trump presidency ended in 2019. Right. right. And there so, is no 2020. And, and so I think I could have pushed back on that more. And, and I just I, I guess I just wasn't prepared for the rebuttal because it, like, it does seem so nonsensical to me that like Joe Biden has to be is responsible for sure. the Iranian attack on Israel. And yet Donald Trump is not responsible for the covid deaths in America. And, and so I, I do think kind of preparing that sort of rebuttal for, you know, whatever Fourth of July barbecue with Uncle Joe, it might be something that's useful. I, I will say this. Uh, I want everybody to live as their authentic selves. Mm. And listen. Like Mike to, Pence, by the way. I wish like we Mike could Pence. free Ross to be like Mike oh, Pence, Pence, who's Mike too Pence. honest now and is able to just just let his freak flag fly. Oh, boy. Uh, you know, so I. Ross. Ross spent a lot of time talking about how great all the outcomes were during the Trump years. Again, yes. I'll mention the final year. Um, I didn't hear a lot like what I would have asked Trump is so what I would have asked Ross was why not Trump? Why not? I mean, if things were OK, he had, something else he said really struck me. So Ross spends a lot of his time castigating people about being alarmists. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and you asked him, uh, you know, if I had come back to you in 2015 and showed you what happened in 2020, would you have? said like you know oh it was i'm being alarmed and ross was like oh no everything i thought it would be much much worse i think ross is the only person i've ever heard say that he thought the trump years turned out to be much better than he'd expected and and as i started having that thought then i realized no that's not true there are lots of people who say that those people are jd vance and matt schlapp and all the people right. who support donald trump now and so Ross is just with those guys, and I wish he could just say it, and he'd be happier, he'd be a more fulfilled person, and uh, and he'd be true to his authentic self, and it'd be fine. I don't know if that's right. I don't know. AB, what about you? Did Donald Trump surprise you? Did he? Were things all so much better? Enriched than oh, wait, at all by so, the Trump um, years, or pleasantly? So this is the this is another occasion for me to to I've told this story before, but for anyone in the audience who doesn't know it. I think sometime in 2019, Tim and I did get the chance to see each other at 30 Rock That's in true. New York in between MSNBC hits. And I said, no, if he wins next year, there will be tanks in the street and women won't work. And Tim Miller said to me at the time, oh, oh I, I'm not as dark as I'm not there. Like, OK, maybe okay. that's I'm sorry for you. Like. Wow, I'm in a really sick. bad place, by the way. But that was like, wow. OK, that was I was too <laughs> I was too far for yeah. him which is why I have this reserve of rage for people like John Kelly, who now are telling us it was really bad, who knew then how bad it would be if he won in November of 2020. And we didn't have January 6th. We just had the second term of Donald Trump in which he was going to do Project 2025 for 2021 and pull us out of NATO and completely give everything to, to Vladimir Putin. So they all knew that. They didn't warn us. And then we had to get what we got. So, no, um, I always expected a man who told me in 2015 that he had no time or use for the Congress or the Constitution or the courts. I heard him loud and clear. I expected the worst. But still, November and, and December of 2020, the two months of the coup that we had to cover at the granular level that most Americans are still unaware of. And then January 6th, of course, was definitely worse. Than yeah. All right. One last thing, then we'll get out of this. Uh, I, 
the the other the only other thing I would ask about is so Ross Ross wrote a book with Ryan Salam called Grand New Party in which he he was arguing for a more populist he didn't say nationalist but it was a very populist Republican Party and uh, he got it we have the populist Republican Party I think Ross thought that uh, Yuval Levin would be in charge of a populist Republican Party but it turns out not to have been that way <laughs> well and this, uh, is... this is just one more thing where I'd like ask so you again you you got the things well we did know we did like kinda... it and are happy with it because I think he is I know you just okay. want him to say he likes Trump but I but we did get that's into okay. this but we did get into this just a little bit on the topic of you know, uh, on abortion, when, on abortion yeah. when he was talking about how we want to, we should be supporting parents and we should have all these programs that help parents. And, and, you know, I was like, well, I just, I don't think that there are a lot of pro-lifers that are for that. And Ross was like, well, no, there are a couple who are your favorites at the bulwark. And he mentions JD Vance and, um, yeah. Marco of, and, and Holly legislation coming out of them. Huh? Yeah. And no. And, and like, that's my thing is just like, that's just not true. Like, I, I, you know, we saw this with Garrett Graves. This it's circles us back palaces. to Garrett Graves. It's the dream palaces, Tim. right? You know, it circles back to Garrett Graves, right? As soon as Joe Biden, if, if God willing, he's elected next year, if he starts in February and is like, I'm calling Ross to the White House and I'm calling Chris Murphy and Elizabeth Warren and J.D. Vance and we're going to come up with a program to support mothers in red states, you know, where where abortion is illegal and we're going to have, you know, paid leave and extra access to medical care and blah, 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 whatever it is. Like, I, the minute that happens, every one of those guys are like, nope, peace, I'm out. Right? Like, none of the, like, maybe JD. I, I, will, I will say JD has just, I, I have a lot of things I hate about JD, but I will say one thing. He has shown that he's, like, willing to work with some Democrats on a few things and that he seems, I don't know, it seems like it's a relatively genuine pivot from to, to this populist person that he's become. But, like, Holly, Marco, you're telling me Marco is going to do a is going to co-bill <laughs> with Elizabeth Warren and Chris Murphy on some kind of bill to help poor mothers? Like, okay, I'll believe it when I see it. I think I'm going to eat my hat. I, maybe had Mitt Romney got been forced out of the party, he might have done that. Um, he he's been pushing for the child tax credit. And again, maybe JD, maybe Susan Collins. But like that's it. Like that's there's just this isn't authentic. It's so not Republican authentic. Republican voters don't like this stuff. I don't yeah, know if right. you guys remember, but in Sarah's focus groups back when the American Rescue Plan was passed, and there was this fantastic child tax credit, which is the th sort of thing that these people would like, right? That I like very much. Uh, and you listen to the focus groups, and the Republicans in the focus groups hated it. And they're like, we're paying people to have babies. These yeah, welfare right. people who, believe me, the, the minute they get the sense that like, oh, this is going to maybe help some brown mothers. Yeah. Uh, they, are, they are out, my friend. Maybe. So, uh, maybe yeah. you, seem, yeah. you, seem, you seem champing at the bit to make one point. On no, I, I just, I so appreciate the honesty that pro-lifers like Mona Charon and David French and JVL have offered up about what the movement is doing, about the lack of support for mothers and families in crisis pregnancies, the, the acknowledgement that many, most abortions are women who already have children who feel that they can't have another child. And this, in the, it, his discomfort about the, the, the gamble, right? The moral call of supporting Trump to therefore protect more babies. You, you could just, he was still rationalizing his choice instead of saying, this is what we wanted in 2016. This was our goal. It's a pure goal. It's a good goal. It's a moral goal. Instead, he was squirming around again um, and not being straight about what the pro-life movement ended up with and what they, and what they are happy to take today um number of abortions anyway are up abortions are rising for the first time since the 1990s just saying it's just a thing that's happening since we're talking about outcomes all right guys good show long show incredibly long show uh may 1st philadelphia i feel like tim and i did cut a promo on this and i felt like this was the old school wwe days when you would get Hulk Hogan coming out. We're coming to Phoenix, brother. And then in June 17th, we're going to be in Oakland's Coliseum. Uh, we're going to be May 1st in Philadelphia, my hometown, my real hometown. I can't wait to be there. 
Uh, maybe we'll all do a meetup at Geno's or something. I don't know. Uh, and then we're May 15th in D.C., which is Tim's spiritual hometown. Mm. And I will be there. I won't be happy about it, but I'll be there. I'm kidding. I'll be thrilled. A.B., thanks for being here. Tim, thanks for just being amazing. Thanks for doing interesting, tough interviews and doing them in such a way that is kind and gentle and authentic. It's doing uh, my it's best. A rare we, gift. We appreciate, I appreciate that. And we love it's you, A.B. Thanks gift. for being on the pod. Bye, guys.